feels like something we're not talking about publicly a lot. We see a lot about layoffs and AI taking over our jobs, but the truth of the matter is, you know, as baby boomers are retiring, especially, and some of what we saw in terms of early retirements during the pandemic really signal a talent shortage. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Break the Wheel. I'm your host, David Murray, and I'm here with Stephanie Lemek, who's former HR executive and founder of The Wounded Workforce. Stephanie, great to have you. So great to be here, David. Thank you so much. When we were first chatting, like I know we connected um, after uh, the the I Hate It Here uh, HR therapy when you were speaking yeah. on, oh my gosh, I was like, I was like, this is my people. I had to chat with you. And then when we connected, I was like... Yeah. Oh my gosh, like everything that you bring into the workplace, it's so unique and I just feel like this audience needs to hear it because it's a it's an angle that's not talked about nearly enough and yet it's so 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 relevant to so many of our day to day. But without further further ado, let's let's dive in first with yes. our uncork and unwind. So today's wine is from Canada and I see ooh, what do you got there? A little goblet. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I like that. It's a goblet. Mystery, mystery goblet. <laughs> it's okay if it's water, by the way. There is nothing wrong with drinking water. I'm just it saying. is. It is. It's, it's a mystery goblet of water, you know. Well, this might be a mystery goblet of um, watered down coffee. You'll never know because it looks like You'll wine. never know. You'll never know. It's but, like Julia Child. So your guests will never know. I don't know why. Like, I, that's I'm stuck in my child. mind. It's like, is so, it water or is it not? You'll never know. Your guests will never know. Yeah. <laughs> Well, today's wine's from Canada, and speaking of Canada, there's a survey that came out that said 8 out of 10 Canadians are looking into new job opportunities this year for better pay, according to a recent report. Pay raises used to be a reward for hard work and loyalty, but this survey reveals that employers now reward pay raises out of a necessity because they are fearful they will not appear as responsible and ethical employers. Thoughts? I am not surprised. I'm not shocked. I think... Um, there's so much discourse around inflation and cost of living, and I am I am a big believer that we have kind of are still experiencing the settling from COVID-19, the pandemic, and how everything changed uh, as we think about that and how we relate to work. And how people relate to work is a really big difference. And for a lot of people, let's be real, a lot of us work to make a living at least to some extent, so that pay is really huge. And I love that kind of ethical context. Are we being ethical as it relates to how we partner with our employees and how we pay them? So I, I'm a fan. I'm very interested to see how this plays out, especially as it relates to pay transparency uh, here, in, here in the States specifically as well. Isn't it funny how, like, for some people talking about, like, hey, I'm showing up to work for pay. I'm not showing up for work because I'm excited and because I want to do this day in and day out. I'm not showing work because I'm passionate. I'm not, it's not a volunteer job. Like, why is that a bad thing? It's not. It's real. I think that's so, it's so funny. People talk all the time about bring your whole self to work or bring your genuine self to work, bring your real self to work. Well, we come to work to get paid. And, and you know, one thing that has always stuck with me you know, I have done a lot of trainings in the construction in industry, and you'll get a lot of real direct answers um, from some construction professionals who've been around for a long time, which I love. I think it's fantastic. And one thing I would always talk about is recognition. Recognition is important. But there are so many people who are out there, my recognition is my paycheck. <laughs> and I think it's important for people to understand that and to appreciate that and understand that it's not a either you have a meaningful job that makes you feel good about what you're doing or you feel like you can contribute or you get paid well, I think it's an ant. And that's going to be very front and center, I think, especially as Gen Z is making its way into our workforce. Absolutely. Like Gen Z, I, I've seen like, okay, you want me to work on the weekends? Okay. Well, don't expect that thank you is all that you're going to give for me to work the weekend. Like I need something in return and it needs to be monetary. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm like millennials. We tried really hard for everyone to like us and to like play by the rules. Gen Z's like, nah, you were just like, everyone's been mean to millennials this whole time. 
And now, now Gen Z is like, we're not going to play by your rules. We're interested in making our own because this has worked out so poorly um, for previous generations. And while it's a challenge, I love it. I love it. I love it too. I mean, like, I don't know, we've had, you know, whatever, our, our helicopter parenting as millennials or everything else, right? We don't know what boundaries are. Suddenly there's a generation being like, hey, I know what boundaries are and I'm going to create some. It's like, I fucking love you. Yeah. Have your boundaries. They're so good at boundaries. I'm so happy for them. I'm yeah. so jealous. I'm so happy for them. Yeah. It's like, oh my goodness. And I think it's going to be so interesting because I think, you know, when you look at the tech industry, for example, that can skew a little bit younger, especially startups skew a little bit younger, typically, you're starting to see them integrating Gen Z into the workforce. There's a lot of, I'll call them more traditional, you know, air quotes, more conservative industries that are really make up a huge portion of our economy, and they do not have large swaths of Gen Z employees coming on board yet. And they're going to, and in the conversations I have, you know, outside of, you know, other HR professionals, by and large, these leaders, these managers aren't prepared for how different the approach is, how different the kind of unspoken employment contract is. It's going to be a rude awakening for some. Yeah. When they're like, boundaries? You want boundaries? That's so foreign to me, you know? Well, so what are those? Get them. <laughs> what are those? I know. You're so true. All right. Next segment, do, 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 HR News Flash. So according to Aware, an AI firm specializing in analyzing employee messages, they said that Walmart, Delta, T-Mobile, Chevron, and Starbucks are among the companies using their technology to monitor their employee messages in Slack, Microsoft Teams, Zoom, and other popular apps. For context, Aware's analytic tools help companies identify trends in employee behavior, enabling them to be to take proactive steps to address any potential problems. It also provides a secure anonymous platform for employees to submit concerns, ensuring that any issues are addressed quickly and efficiently. We have no affiliation, by the way. This is just like the stuff that we found in HR world these days. So feel free to share openly your thoughts. I think I love this, except like we have to have like transparency around it. I love this if. I love this if we're really clear and um, direct with employees about how we're using this information. Uh, are we anonymizing it? Are we creating this situation where people feel their feedback is automatically created? Companies can be proactive. I've actually heard about AI being used for competitors to be proactive, which that blows my mind. It kind of blows my mind in general. I think the key here is how are you using the data? Are you being transparent about how you're using the data data, and being thoughtful about it? Mm. This seems to me so different than like I'm recording keystroke. You know what I mean? The like mm. monitoring software. Um, and I, you know, just read an article about if you're mon- using any kind of monitoring software, the key is trust. How you leverage it, how you build trust is the backbone. So I love it. I love technology. But trust is key. Yeah. I'm not a butt I, person, like, <laughs> anatomically, <laughs> to be clear. Well, I many mean... of us are. I think we're all born with one, you know, from last I checked. <laughs> nevertheless, <laughs> nevertheless, I'm, uh, you know, I'm like, oh, this is going to derail real fast. No. Uh, the, so what's, I always feel conflict about things like this when you hear about, like, sur- mm-hmm. whether you call it surveillance technology or technology to help identify things using AI, yada, yada, because... On the one hand, we all know that this is our future. We all know that this is like big brother and all of that. Like that is our future. We, as much as we fight it, it's really not going to be something that we can fight in terms of it just being part of our day to day. And, And rather than just saying, screw this, I hate it. I don't, you know, it's like, what if if we know it's going to be part of our day to day and we have to accept that, then what does that look like? And exactly to your point, what's, what's safe? What's not, you know? I think if we can reframe, and I think that's super helpful for those of us who are maybe uncomfortable with you. I dropped my mic. Sorry. Go ahead, please. You continue. actually dropped the mic. I, I dropped the mic. It on wasn't it. that exciting what I was going to say. You know, this um, is what work from home looks like anyway. <laughs> please continue, somebody. No, I really think, you know, for those of us who have, you know, varying degrees of comfort with technology, maybe no comfort with te- technology, maybe super comfortable with technology. I think the thing for us to always consider with any technology is the technology itself. Is it like good, bad, ugly, evil? You know, it is how we apply it as human beings. It's the human beings 
behind the intent, the impact, everything going on, that that's why I really like to say I like this, but it's the but is how are people using it? How are we going to move forward with this? And you can take the greatest thing ever and turn it into something really negative if you misuse that. Um, I'm sure we've all seen it. I mean, it can be as simple as, you know, a business book, you know, a, a business book I've seen used great. And then also wildly misuse, even though she talks about it right in the book, Radical Candor. I I've knew you were going to say that. Yeah. Because <laughs> I tell you, like sometimes. People are like, I'm going to challenge directly by being an asshole. It's like, no, Right? Okay, it's like not... she literally, like she even like wrote an additional thing like, yo, you're misusing this. And people still like to misuse it. And so I think, too, it's really important when we talk about intent and impact. And that's with anything applies to technology as well. So I like to not vilify technology. Technology is amazing. It gets to how we decide to use it. Absolutely. Well, talking about how we decide to use things, what a great transition to reality check about your world and how yes. you decide to use everything that you use to do what makes yourself very unique. Please share, share with, with everybody what you do. And, oh, I'm so excited for this one because it's so unique. Yes. I am super excited. I'm so grateful to you, David, for the opportunity to chat about this and, and your passion behind it. It is it is my uh, passion project, my labor of love, it is my organization, The Wounded Workforce, and it is all about building trauma-informed workplaces. Hmm. You know, to, to give you the Cliff Notes version of how I got here, you know, I've got over 16 years of experience in corporate HR. And I've seen, you know, from my own experience and then from, you know, that HR experience, how individuals' traumatic experiences show up at work. And sometimes we don't even know. Like, I'll be honest, for the vast majority of my career, I didn't realize how my own traumatic experiences were showing up in the workplace. And, you know, I started doing a little bit of digging. I got really interested in learning more. I wanted to read a book. I wanted to, you know, kind of help support a movement of bringing trauma-informed care and culture into the workplace. And I couldn't find what I was looking for. And that's how this was born, is I really want to translate the concepts of being trauma-informed into the workplace. And to give a very high-level overview of what it means to be trauma-informed, it means that organizations are aware of the prevalence of trauma. Over 70% of U.S. adults self-identify. So they're raising their own hands as having one or more traumatic experience in their lifetimes. In terms of calling folks in, men are actually 10% more likely to self-identify as having experienced trauma as well. Um, so an interesting nuance there. Informed. Informed as to how trauma may show up at work, impacts of trauma. Do you know, what is this whole trauma thing and and how, how is it showing up in the workplace? How is it showing up in my life? Then the next two things about a trauma-informed workplace are we're looking to make sure we're actively avoiding re-traumatizing survivors. And finally, we are avoiding actively creating any harm. And so we're looking to minimize any harm to anyone. That's our employees. That's our customers, clients. Those are the communities we serve. Super important, and it gets back to my intent and impact behind everything we do. Trauma-informed workplaces never seek to diagnose or treat trauma. Like hard no, hard stop. That is best left to third-party clinicians to do that work. But workplaces can provide the structures, supports, and systems to make work better for everyone. And also, like we talked about earlier, people want to do work that's meaningful to them and want to feel empowered and recognize their work. For, so for some people, a meaningful job, a job that is a safe, trauma-informed culture, that can actually be a proactive aspect of trauma recovery for them. Very high level, that is the work that I'm doing really looking to build awareness, make these concepts and principles accessible to people in the workplace, you know, kind of mull through some of those psychology terms, you know, really, you know, triple down on efforts to talk about mental health in the workplace as well, and build from there. Mm. 
So what are some either like behaviors or processes or things that you see that, that are different at a trauma-informed mm-hmm. workplace versus one that isn't so trauma-informed? Yeah. So I would say, you know, the number one thing uh, I would look at, and, and at the Wounded Workforce, we use the seven principles of trauma-informed cultures, which are based on the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration principles of trauma-informed care that are about 30 years old. Um, de- they were developed for clinical practice. And they're the root of all kind of trauma-informed things. So if you see trauma-informed teaching, trauma-informed yoga, it all goes back to that. So these seven principles are safety. That includes physical safety, psychological safety, financial safety, trust and transparency, collaboration, and collaboration also gets to positional power and power dynamics um, when we look at it in the workplace. Community, so building a sense of community and belonging. Empowerment. Empowerment is probably the number one spot. Uh, most organizations are either already doing something, be really easy to work through empowerment as a place to build trauma-informed workplaces. Why? Because at the source of Traumatic experiences is a sense of powerlessness or removal of your power. So empowerment is really powerful. Empowerment comes to choice. Strengths are being leveraged. You have opportunities for growth and recognition. Those are probably four things you're already talking about when you think about your talent and your workplace. And then the last two principles are humility and responsiveness. It's recognizing None of us are ever going to per- be perfect all the time. Organizations aren't always going to be perfect. Recognizing that and then taking action to make things better. And then finally, cultural, historical, and gender issues. This is really the lens of understanding that is you know, DEI, how these different things play into how we experience our world, our lives, and how that plays into the workplace, how that plays into experiences and recovery from trauma. So Mm -hmm. I always say, you know, there's so many different things organizations can do. If you're looking to start a trauma-informed journey, I would pick either safety or empowerment as places to start because probably you're already doing something in those areas and then you can kind of build naturally from there. It's really a journey when it comes to being a trauma-informed workplace, much like culture is an ongoing journey. Um, it's not, you know, the destination, so to speak. Yeah. So, you know, I'm thinking about, um, I imagine, right, at least 70% of the folks who are listening probably who have experienced trauma and, and know how it impacts them at the workplace. I mean, I think about this for, for myself, you know, my yeah. 20 plus years of therapy, you know, it's, it informs a lot about what I either do or yeah. don't do or avoid or, you know, um, you know, obviously these days, like DEI, you know, Groups, organizations, team members are getting cut left and right. People are getting yeah. laid off. Whole departments are disappearing. And so I imagine that um, some listeners may say, I really love this. I want it in our workplace. Mm-hmm. But like they're already like stripping back, you know, just even DEI basic stuff. And and I guess the question is, how can I position uh, advocating for making these kinds of changes to a boss that's very like financially motivated? How can I make like a business case about why this is important. Absolutely. I think, you know, the business case really gets a lot to as it relates to employee engagement. So, you know, many of us, especially in the HR space, are well versed on HR statistics, HR data around employee engagement and retention. And that is incredibly relevant when we look at this. And I think the build out point when it comes to any mental health or trauma-informed advocacy in the workplace, it's really about our changing relationship with work. I think there are many things that are hallmark of you know our experience in the pandemic, but I think for the workplace, it is every single one of us, our relationship with work changed fundamentally in some way. And like I said earlier, I don't think the dust has quite settled yet when it comes to that. So how can we relate to leveraging and better understanding how we're relating to employees in the workplace and maintaining those employment relationships? 
The next big one is Gen Z. I talk about Gen Z a lot because I think Gen Z is really going to push this movement really far for us because Gen Z does want to be able to show up at work. You know, something like over 90% of Gen Z college grads said they would leave a job if it became toxic. And this was a survey from Monster, you know, late last year. So these are really things that are not negotiable for, you know, recruiting and retention. We talk about recruiting and retention a lot as HR professionals. I think some of the missing context that's going to become really important within the next few years is the declining population of our workforce. Mm. Um, you talk to HR professionals and we talk about it together frequently, but it feels like something we're not talking about publicly a lot. We see a lot about layoffs and AI taking over our jobs. But the truth of the matter is, you know, as baby boomers are retiring, especially, and some of what we saw in terms of early retirements during the pandemic really signal a talent shortage. And for some industries, it is worse than others. So I, I mentioned construction earlier for construction. It is probably some of the most dire challenges as it relates to recruiting and retaining talent. You need a lot more tools than just kind of throwing money at the problem. We see how well that worked out, you know, pretty recently when we look at some of the tech competition we saw, you know, a few years ago uh, for talent. So I think this is something that's building up over time. And I think if folks aren't investing now in 10 years, they won't have enough employees to run their businesses. I also think investing in trauma-informed workplaces, investing in mental health and well-being for your employees actually does not have to be that costly as well. Um, you know, there are some things that are, you know, huge financial investments, and certainly there are time investments that count as part of that expenditure. When we talk about, you know, building a trauma-informed workplace, it could be as simple as maybe your HR team learns about what trauma is. And I have a ton of free resources, and that's why they're free, is so folks can access them and have a better understanding about what trauma is and how to be trauma informed, you can start simple by, we wanna invest in empowering our team more. So how can, when we do things, when we create processes, when we design initiatives, when we teach and train our managers, how can we encourage them to create choice for their employees? So that right there, that exercise right there is a significant investment in becoming more trauma-informed, especially if you really follow through with it. And certainly there's a time investment, but there's there's no, you know, going and buying programs and products and different things. And it's really it's really about the culture and how you think and consider about how you build out the workplace experience. Totally resonates. And the, the create choice piece hits home for me because I, you know, I had a therapist recently who was telling me, you know, like, the difference between just going through a hard time or a challenging time at work and experiencing mm -hmm. trauma, he said that like uh, a lot of, of, of what he's learned is, is that it's, it's really about choice and feeling yeah. the sense of choice. And that when you yeah. feel a sense of choice, you know, some, something that may still be very challenging, you may not experience is traumatic. Whereas when you don't feel that sense of choice, you know, you might experience uh, trauma. So absolutely. With, Really, really fascinating. Uh, so transitioning into people misunderstand, I would love to hear what do people misunderstand about your job or, or this space or maybe even something you see every day? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding as it comes to mental health, mental health at work, talking about trauma. And the first thing I will say is everyone has mental health. Um, I think if there's one thing we could talk about collectively is, you know, the idea everyone has mental health, just like we all have physical health. So we often focus on, you know, what's wrong. We, we focus on an issue um, when we talk about mental health. So perhaps a mental illness, a crisis, substance abuse, things like that. But we all have mental health, regardless of whether or not we experience a crisis. So how can we proactively support mental health for all of our employees? And, you know, 
statistics show 70% of your employees want that mental health support proactively, even if they aren't going to leverage benefits that are related to looking at, you know, emergent mental health care, we'll call it. So that's the number one misconception. And then I think the other thing for me is what what is trauma? I think <laughs> I say trauma and I get a whole I always like to start, you know, when I'm talking with a group, training, having a conversation, you know, what is trauma? You get a whole different group of reactions. And it's to be expected. The, you know, concept of trauma is relatively new as it relates to, you know, psychology, medical care. And so, of course, we're going to see different understandings. I, I joke and I say, you know, our oldest generation in the workforce probably thinks of trauma as, you know, a specific traumatic event or a veteran returning from, you know, an active war zone. Absolutely trauma. But then, you know, Gen Z, Gen A, you look at them, they're talking about trauma and trauma bonding on TikTok. So there's just this different level of comfort and language. And so I always like to go back to what is the definition of trauma? How can we talk through it? And the definition of trauma is pretty darn broad. It is an event, series of events, or set of circumstances that is experienced as traumatic or life-threatening and has lasting effects on someone's performance, life, beliefs, you know, relationships, kind of that lasting effects that can be short-term or long-term. And I always say, think, think of the three E's when you think of trauma. Event, how that event is experienced by an individual person, and then those lasting effects of the traumatic experience. The thing is, everything, trauma is kind of like a snowflake. Everyone's experience is going to be different, even of the same event. COVID is an excellent example for all of us. We all lived collectively through a pandemic, which is a traumatic event, but we all had different experiences and different lasting effects. So again, something very individualized, but those are the two things when I think of, you know, what do people misunderstand? I think it's, you know, mental health is all of us, and, you know, what is trauma? And it is a relatively expansive definition. Hmm. I love that, you know, you know, because I think certainly some folks might, who've had very egregious severe trauma might yeah. um, be inclined to discount, for example, like the, you know, Gen Z trauma saying, yeah. you know, oh, this isn't really serious, et cetera. But then we forget that it's not about like, you like you can't place your own experience on someone else. Right. Like what somebody experiences as trauma, like that's, that's trauma. There's nothing that they need to say or do to say this is actually trauma or this yeah. isn't trauma, right? It's, it's not a contest either. Like there's no award for like most traumatic experience. Like, and, and again, Every one of our experiences informs the next experience in our life. It's like our life is a suitcase or a snowball. It's all building on itself. So something for someone could not, if someone could experience something that's not traumatic at all. Someone could have an previous experiences in their life, and that same event could be very traumatic, very troubling. And that's, I mean, that's people, isn't it? You know, folks who are listening to this podcast work a lot with people, and we know People really are unique. And as much as we look to guide and kind of fence in with process and procedures, there's also the nuance of how different we all are. Mm -hmm. 100%. Well, I love that. And mental health is a great transition to our next segment with Break the Wheel or Break a Heel. And the topic is mental health. So Woo! there you go. We're going to go through each of these items and you're going to say a break the wheel if you think that that thing is, is good, innovative, like really, really serving or break a heel, meaning like what breaking a heel feels All like. Right. So right. first one, <laughs> mental health coverage in employees' health insurance. Break the wheel or break a heel? Break the wheel. Mm. But like, right. I, this is tough. Like this, again, like just like we should all have coverage for our annual physicals for our medical care. We should all have coverage for mental health in our care as well I have I have like a bone to a systemic bone to pick because mental health care is so inaccessible especially when we talk about so the United States it is so inaccessible and it is 
I mean, the amount of privilege it requires to access mental health care is wild. To be able to find a practitioner who is taking new patients, who takes your insurance, and if there is a specific part of your identity or experience that you would like someone who can relate to you, who can relate to your experiences, good luck. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, truly, it is very, very inaccessible. And there are systemic issues around that. And so I think there's a real opportunity for employers. I don't know if you can hear my dog coughing in the background. She's <laughs> oh, is that what that is? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's how she gets attention. She's the reincarnation of Elizabeth Taylor. That's a story for oh, another day. That. But yeah, she's a special lady. Um, she knows when I'm recording. She's like, it's time to cough. Um, but I really think employers have an opportunity to demand better access to mental health care coverage from insurance providers. Because who's paying insurance providers? Who's their biggest client? Well, it's some of the biggest employers out there. Um, so I say break the wheel, but I also yeah. think there's a real opportunity for especially employers, um, you know, organizations representing employers, employees, HR professionals yeah. to do more as it relates to what that looks like. Makes sense. All right. Moving on to these next ones. So putting 30 minutes, uh, do not, do, DNC, do not calendar on your calendar for mental health. Break the wheel or break a heel? Break the wheel. Yeah. Go for I, it. I agree. Personal no emails after five policy. I'm going to say break the wheel. I always, like, again, with the butts. I think this is, like, find a way that works for you. Like, mm -hmm. find a communication avenue that works for you and communicate it. I think the more senior you are in an organization, the more important the communicating it part. Counts. Absolutely. I yeah. this resonates a lot. Like you can, you, and you can create, I mean, that's the thing about boundaries. Like you can create a boundary and sometimes that yeah. can spark a conversation. And sometimes yeah. you may be willing to renegotiate the boundary in mm -hmm. the context of other things yeah. at play. So totally makes sense. Also, if you're going to set a boundary and then not uphold the boundary, you're actually doing more harm. Right. To you're just the relationship and every, everyone. You can involved. walk all over me. Totally. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, next, therapy session during the workday. Break the wheel or break a heel? Break the wheel. Love it. Love it. Taking a mental health day. Break the wheel Bre or break a heel? Break the wheel. Yeah. <laughs> all these are break the wheel. I guess no, I'm no, a, I'm uh, a, I'm no heel breakers all of this week. Yeah. That's great. Hey, that's great. I think that that's great. All right, well, then diving in with more wheel breaking, we're going to get the wheel breaker of the week. So Starbucks unveiled its inclusive spaces framework on February 16th to introduce new accessibility features that the company hopes will benefit disabled employees and patrons at its new U.S. retail locations. It developed the features in partnership with disability organizations and tested them in its trial lab in Seattle. The new accessibility features include order status boards for employees who may be unable to verbally alert customers when an order is ready, lower counters to help wheelchair, user, wheelchair users or people who are short easily reach coffee machines and point of sale systems, lighting and acoustics changes that can help employees who have visual impairments use hearing aids or who are neurodivergent with sensory sensitivities, <laughs> that's me, uh, and inclusive equipment including a new coffee brewer with features like a larger dial, haptic confirmation, and a light for employees with vision or hearing disabilities. Thoughts on that? I freaking love it. One thing that stands out to me when you were sharing this, David, is they worked on this in partnership with a disability organization. I think that is the key here is like really being thoughtful about the community you're looking to support. And while I'm clearly on one about mental health and trauma-informed workplaces, I'm also quite on one about disability employment. I think, again, this is something where so many organizations are missing out on amazing, talented workforce because they are not accessible enough. And I think this here also highlights that access to customers who experience, you know, some sort of disabilities. I'm a big believer that the more we can include people, the better. So I love this. I'm super excited to see it expand. And I think when, you know, organizations are looking to do similar things like this, 
that partnership with impacted or targeted groups is key. Because if you're going to invest all of all of this, why not actually ask the people you're looking to support what they need? Absolutely. I love it. I love it. Well, moving on, you, you've provided a lot of wisdom already. So I'm going to say that the wisdom on the rocks has been, has been given. We're Perfect. going to dive into to what should I have done? Ooh, uh, I love well, it. I'm, going to share. <laughs> I, I'm sure you will on this one. I mean, for folks that don't know, I, I'm like, should I, should I spill the goss? I, re- I want to share what happened on LinkedIn subtly. Can I? Am I allowed? Yeah. Oh, for sure. Let's <laughs> do it. Oh, so actually, maybe you should share. I don't want to take your voice away, and then I'll share what I shared. I mean, we're we're talking me? our, our about our friend. I'm assuming. Yeah. <laughs> so I host a series of panels. I do a monthly panel um, on LinkedIn and Facebook, and then they're also all recorded on YouTube. And I get a bunch of amazing folks to to come on and talk about different topics as it relates to trauma informed workplaces, and. These folks are all volunteering their time and their expertise. I'm so grateful to each of them. And I work very hard. My my hardest little one woman entrepreneurship show to create diversity in, in these conversations. Sometimes I do better than others. I'm not perfect. And, and I'm transparent about that. <laughs> I have an upcoming panel in March. And all of all of our panelists are women on that panel. Women also, just to be honest, are frequently in in HR and also are f- much more willing to talk about some of these topics. Um, and s- this gentleman, I don't know, commented, why are there no more men on this panel? <laughs> and I said, you know, it was a bit of a burr in my side, but I said, you know, I tried to offer a little bit of what I explained here, you know, for everyone who might see that comment, like, hey, I, I, I try my best. I don't always succeed, but certainly men are part of this discussion, as always. Um, I think they're an important part. And then I hoped in another comment that he also asked where women are when he, see pan- he sees panels of all men, because I feel like maybe that happens a little more frequently. But, um, and then I had a few fantastic uh, allies, active allies, come in on the comments and, you know, provide some support and context for this individual. One of those being David. So I don't know if you want to share a little bit of what you included. But yeah. I- I'm trying to find, I'm like trying to find the the thread because I'm like, I want to like, I can't find like the, the link to it because I feel like the, the wording was like really uh, appropriate. I'm like, if you can find it. <laughs> yeah. Let me find it. But it's so, it was so funny, though. Also, so like my brother is a my brother is a firefighter paramedic. He's actually the director of education for his fire department. Um, and he was gracious enough to be on my very first panel. And he he he's uh, got a fantastic sense of humor. And he actually posted a comment on it as well. And it was just a meme he created with pictures of all of the men who have been on my different panels. So that was a fun little tongue and cheek one. But I have your comment pulled up if you want me to read it, David. Please do. All right. It says, this panel looks awesome. It takes true bravery to put such an emotional topic out there into the LinkedIn public eye and invite scrutiny. I can't help but notice the irony that seeing someone feel comfortable enough to criticize in public instead of private It's such a great example of toxic stress that innovators often encounter and the reasons why panels like this are so important. The fact that someone feels the psychological safety to share this kind of criticism publicly versus privately, I can't help but recognize that this same psychological safety very rarely exists when the tables are turned. I've seen too many panels with most or all white men where nobody bats an eyelash or says anything in public. I'm hopeful that more and more private conversations are had when this occurs in the spirit of equity. I am still learning and growing on this topic and will for the rest of my life, but I know that there are so many business reasons why this panel is worth attending to maintain a healthy culture. We know the research that psychological safety is the number one indicator of team success on the job. I can't wait for the day when that safety is shared equitably. Oh, I'm like... like... You were so good. Look at you. (laughs) I spent a lot of time on that. <laughs> but I'm, it was amazing, though. You, it was, it's like someone's got to s- s- 
speak up, you know, like, and, and defend you. Like, I was just like, ah. Oh. I, I mean, I think, like, genuinely, for me, at least, it really, it was very meaningful because I think, you know, two things, especially as a woman, and, and I'm coming from a place of privilege. I'm a white woman. As a white woman, even, you know, in public spaces, people can be quite vitriolic um, when you're putting yourself out there. And it can feel unsafe. And I would say, you know, LinkedIn is some of the safest social media out there, and it still gets a little nasty sometimes. And so, you know, it's choosing when to and not to interact is so important. But then actually having, you know, white men step up and say, like, really? Like, come on. It, I think it's really powerful because it feels like I don't have to take on all that labor. Um, and I wish more people would do it. And so I, it made my day, David, when you did that. It, it, it's really hard. Like it is, it is really hard to talk about some of the stuff I talk about. Um, and it is a labor of love. And to have folks recognize that is really, it means a lot. And I'm sure that goes yeah. for anyone who, you know, works hard at their job, anyone who's an entrepreneur, you know, we all, we all that need that little bit of recognition, that little, like, keep going. Yeah. Every and it's scary to post stuff on LinkedIn. It's scary to like put yourself out there, especially on topics that like maybe people aren't as receptive to, you know? Yeah. It's scary. You need that support. So it is. I'm glad, it is. I'm glad, well, I'm thank glad you. that we can support each other. I know. I so, love it. I appreciate you. So the what should I have done, like the quick version is I'm following somebody on LinkedIn who posts a lot of important things for the industry that I should be aware of, but also posts a lot of annoying things that trigger me. Do I unfollow yeah. them or not? What should I have done? I unfollow them, but what should mm -hmm. I have done? I mean, I think it, it depends. Again, the but, the, it depends. I think it, the relationship is important context. I think you have relationship with someone to like have a conversation that could be productive. I think that's worth trying, but I'm an unfollow gal too. Like if it's not serving anyone, unfollow, mute, block. Someone keeps it. looking block. at your profile, block. Yeah, <laughs> block away. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think if someone is raising a legitimate concern and maybe you know, it, it grates on you, maybe, you know, do an internal check, check in before you hit block. But if someone is repeatedly being, you know, antagonistic or unhelpful or smearing their poop on the wall, as I like to say, <laughs> block them. Amen. Amen. <laughs> All right. Speaking of smearing poop on the wall, horror story of the week. Oh my God. Tell us, what's your horror story? Okay. My, okay. Goodness. Okay. My very first job, uh, full-time out of college, I work at a debt collection call center and oh. <laughs> yeah. I got a complaint probably like six months in and I was in a panic because there was a complaint about someone who worked there that had been very publicly fired. Like it was in the newspapers that they had been fired several years ago because they had gone to a Ku Klux Klan meeting. Oy. And <laughs> So I received a complaint about this and I was like, I was 20. I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? So I immediately called my vice president and I was like, hello, what do we do about this? Like, how did we not know? And she was like, oh, we know. Did he do anything? Like, is he actively doing anything? Like, did he do anything racist? And well, this Other than attend a Ku Klux Klan meeting. <laughs> And then, so this person had been hired with knowledge of that. And this person was in a position of power um, or authority that I could see it being very uncomfortable for people of color um, in our building, and I, which is the huge population. And so, yeah, uh, don't hire, like Google someone. Run a background check, Google someone, and then think about the context of their job, I guess. Lightning just struck, by the learned. way. <laughs> that was well, like the only lightning of the day in the horror story, and that's freaking scary. Ooh. So that's the horror story. And, I mean, it was a different time. I'm not, I mean, I don't feel like I'm that old, but it's enough of a different time that, you know, I wasn't Googling everyone I worked with. But I think that's a really important thing to understand is if someone's information that they're putting out there 
into the world, is that available? The power you're giving them within an organization and what that communicates to your employees as well. Wild. Wow. Oh, wow. Well, that's cray cray. Yeah. Okay. I could write Moving a whole on. book on that whole job. <laughs> oh, I, I believe it. I mean, debt collecting alone. I'm like fascinating industry it would not oh, want to yes. be, I mean, bring, bring me job. some popcorn and put it on the TV, but like, no, I don't want to be there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. Moving on to the Wabi wheel of the week. So tech giant Broadcom recently announced that they will be laying off 1800 employees for the, from their software team in hopes of increasing profitability. They decided that generative AI as the leading reason is the reason why they were able to make the change. Thoughts on that? I would be very interested to understand exactly how generative AI is replacing H and M employees. I know. I'm like, what version of ChatGPT are they using? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, sign me up for that. Can it do all my job? Because I want to. I want to take a break. I, yeah, it sounds. It sounds like maybe there's something there, but it also sounds like a very like broad brush excuse. Absolutely. My goodness. All right. Moving on. We're, we're almost wrapping up here soon. HR speak funny. So this is where we talk about a term in HR world and we make fun of it. So today's term is golden handcuffs, financial allurements, allurements, and benefits that encourage employees to remain with a company rather than moving to another employer. Typically, they're in the form of stock options, bonuses, or other financial rewards. First of all, like golden handcuffs. Like why do people use that at work? Huh? Have you heard this term? Have you used oh, this term? Oh, yes. Yes, I've heard this term. And like, some man thought of this. But every time I hear this, all I think is, why do you want someone handcuffed to your place of employment? Who's disengaged, oh. who doesn't want to be there, like, who's bad manager. And it's always somebody who's like, who's like, ready to like, put into the space. You know, they're like, humble brag, like, oh. I would love to join you and help you on your on your new venture, but I have golden handcuffs. I can't leave because my handcuffs are so golden. I'm just I'm stuck to this bedpost. They won't let me free. Yeah, it's golden it's, handcuffs. What is that creepy Netflix movie? It's like Gerard's Game or something. The lady gets stuck on the handcuffs. I got. Oh, worried. I thought they were oh. going to talk about like um, one of the what like cannibal. You know, like what's his name. <laughs> I don't know, but yeah, like nothing we talk about at work should give horror movie vibes. How about that? I agree. All right. Final segment before our cheers to change is decline to comment. So I'm going to ask you three questions All right. in order okay. and you are allowed to decline to only one. You ready? Okay. Yes. It's always tough to do this one when we create boundaries. So here's the deal. Nobody's going to die if, if you don't, if you don't, you know, go by the game, but do your best. All oh. right. Number one. What is the worst thing that you find about working in HR? It is how everyone hates HR and acts like we're the worst people ever. Like the post, HR is not here to help you. HR is just 12 rats hiding in a trench coat. Like, I don't know. Like, leave us alone. Seriously. Amen. All right. Next, which major HR influencer do you think is least deserving of their influence? Listen, I'm not going to name any names on this one, so I'll call this my decline to answer. But if you're like a white guy and you don't actually post any meaningful content, you just post like two sentences and you have like 100,000 followers, like get real. <laughs> There's a lot of those. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. I wonder why that is. All right. Cool. Number three. <laughs> what is one negative trait? that most people you find in HR share? Taking on too much, trying to do too much, trying to do it all yourself. That is such like, you know, when people are like, tell me, tell me uh, you're in an interview. What is your greatest weakness? And it's like, I mm -hmm. work too hard. But it's true. It's true because HR it is. It is. is continuously understaffed, under-resourced, always seen as a cost center, even when they're creating value for the business. It's messed up. Uh-huh. So. All right. Well, with that, I can't believe it. this time has flown by. It is time to cheers to change, right? Flown by. Yes. In a dog eat dog world where hustle culture is frequently rewarded, workers often feel obligated to reply to managers no matter the time of day or night. I'm one of those people. Earlier this month, the Australian Senate passed an amendment to the Fair Work Legislation Act, allowing workers to ignore work-related messages outside of normal working hours. Satellite view. Australia isn't the first country to impose this type of law. Mexico, Argentina, and the Czech Republic all passed similar legislation as a result of the remote work boom. And I will say 
Cheers to creating boundaries, whatever that looks like for you. Nobody can take that away from you. Boundaries yours. And Stephanie, it was fantastic to chat with you. I'm so glad that people can hear about the wounded workplace. They can hear about trauma-informed workplaces. And y'all should check her out, find her on LinkedIn, and, you know, connect, you know, because you could benefit from some of the services that Stephanie can provide. So with that, cheers, Stephanie. Cheers, David. Thank you so much for having me.